Hey, hello everyone. Hi, my name is Maxim Kalilov and uh, I'm the head of data science at the company which is called uh, Glovo. I think that some of you might, especially those who live in the south of Europe, know, uh, know about this company. So, uh, and uh, today I'm going to tell you about the use of machine learning for in the in-demand delivery industry. So, um, basically, I have four sections in my in my talk, right? So, first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the global story. So, uh, how the company started, what we do, uh, where we're going. Then, uh, I'm going to give you an overview of the machine learning uh, at Global in general. Afterwards, we'll do a little bit of a deep dive into the dispatching use case. So, which is, I would say, very specific to our industry, and I think pretty pretty interesting to to go through. And finally, um, I briefly um, describe actually the metrics that we use uh, uh, to measure the health of our machine learning models in production. Cool. So first of all, Glovo, right? So for those who are not familiar with, uh, with our application, so we are basically the, uh, the app, right? And we allow to connect uh, citizens with possibilities. So uh, what it means. So basically with the app, you can get your restaurant food delivered to your place or wherever you want. You can get your groceries delivered, uh, pharmacy gifts, and many, many other things. So uh, we do it with a, with a, a fleet of couriers, right? So, uh, and uh, we are operational in multiple countries. Um, I'll cover it in the next slide. Uh, but what is important actually is that our mission is to give everyone easy access to every anything in their city, right? So as you see, it's uh, not just focused on, uh, let's say, uh, restaurant food, uh, but our ambitions are much wider. Uh, we are a pretty new company. We were founded in 2015, so around um, uh, six, almost seven years ago. Um, but we, are, um, we have like around 3,000 employees already. So we've grown like very fast. And um, I mean, I joined the company like around one and a half years ago, a little bit more than that. And I can say that it was, it's been like a very interesting and exciting journey. So yeah, by the way, our CEO, he was 22 when he founded the company, which is also, I would say, uh, exceptional. And yes, we are born and uh, in Barcelona and our headquarters is there. So, uh, yeah, as I said, we are operational in 22 countries. Our geography is also pretty interesting. So it's south of Europe, Portugal, Spain, uh, Italy. Um, we are also present in Poland, um, then Ukraine, uh, some countries in the uh, Stans area, so Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan. Uh, we have like a pretty heavy presence in Africa and uh, uh, some countries in the um, uh, Caucasian um, region plus Romania and uh, countries in that region. So we have around 60,000 blowers right now. Blowers are basically couriers who are delivering, um, delivering the things that we offer on the platform. Um, yes, and we're operational in more than 1,000 cities. So now about machine learning. Um, as you can imagine, so there are like uh, different groups of users since we're a three-party platform. So we have customers, we have uh, partners, and we also have um, our couriers. So as you can imagine, there are quite a lot of uh, a lot to do on the machine learning side. So on the customer side, basically, we have like a, a lot of very traditional um, for e-commerce applications for machine learning. So it can be uh, recommendations, can be sorting, can be a ranking. So a, everything that is related to how um, how the app operates, right? So chatbots, chatbots as well, and uh, some specific models related to estimated time of food delivery, for example, or when the courier is supposed to uh, arrive to the restaurant. But we're going to deep dive into that a little bit later. So uh, internally, we also have quite a lot of demand for machine learning. So primarily, we are talking about dispatching, right? So how to connect uh, um, orders with couriers in an optimal way. Um, on the marketing side, of course, since we are the company in the e-commerce uh, industry, of course, we need to invest quite a lot into digital marketing, right? And how to allocate uh, the budget, how to spend it in the, in the wisest way. So that's actually a very clear application for machine learning as well. Finance uh, comes after, after us quite a lot. Uh, sales as well, for example, uh, we want to understand what is the factor, what is the probability that our partner would leave us 
uh, one day, sure, and we want to understand how to prevent it and what are the factors um, influencing the partner's decision, right? So uh, on the courier side, we have quite a lot of models which are important for the couriers themselves, right? So for example, they need to know how long will it take to, for food to, to, to be prepared and when they're supposed to uh, get to the restaurant. Um, our partners need us too because they want to know like when the food's supposed to be prepared when the courier arrives, right? So you can see that actually they have um, a very interesting connection here. So, um, and uh, when we think about machine learning and use cases, right, we try to split it like into before an order, during an order and after order journey, right? So uh, before an order, of course, we need to find the best way to show the uh, content on the, on the app on our offering to the customer, right? So uh, we need to show the most relevant content first, because of course we want to uh, offer our customers the best content, the most relevant content to, um, to, to them. Uh, so on the other hand, we also want to prevent fraud, right? So that's why we have uh, the whole cluster, which is related to, which is dedicating the time to, for, to fraud detection and prevent that fraud. So uh, pricing is another very interesting, interesting area for machine learning, right? So, um, and of course, supply provisioning. Since now we are also going deeper and deeper into grocery delivery, we want to ensure that we what we offer to our customers on the app, I don't know, for example, water or whatever, right? Uh, there were other goods. Uh, we can provide them because the worst customer experience, as you can imagine, then when you order something on the app and, and expect it to be delivered, but then we tell you like, sorry, we run out of that good, right? So um, that is something that we also need to need to think about and use machine learning in some cases. So during an order, of course, we want to um, have an optimal assignment of a courier to the delivery. I want to understand actually what are the incentives for difficult orders, right? So the couriers, for example, when they have to travel far on the, on, or when they have to um, uh, bring the order, which is like big or heavy or bulky, uh, of course, we want to compensate them fairly for uh, that effort. So, and what is fairly, it's another interesting task for machine learning. So uh, incident resolution um, here, of course, I mean, as we scale, we need to think about automation, we need to think about scalability, it's another area. And after an order, uh, of course, we want to understand the churn. I think I uh, touched based on that in relation to partner, but it's not just a partner churn, it's a customer churn and courier churn. We want to understand what is a LTV of the customer lifetime value because it's very important for marketing and other like after sale uh, services, um, for example, I mean, your, um, it's not just after selling, right? So it's also like up for up selling and uh, cross selling, which is an interesting opportunity that we are, we are getting in right now. So a little bit on the, about tools. Um, uh, so for people working in industry or maybe in small organizations, I think it would be interesting to uh, see what we're using to put our models in production and to ensure scalability. So we invested and developed our own machine learning platform, which uh, helps us with uh, that. So in some cases, we use uh, real-time uh, machine learning architecture. So when actually the machine learning models are available somewhere in the cloud, and we talk to them via the API, so every time when we need a prediction or whatever. So we send the request by the API, the model um, finds the answer, so it makes the inference and send it back to us. In other cases, we don't need that. So in other cases, we do the pre-calculation. So once a day, for example, you calculate the big table, uh, let's say uh, for recommendations, right? So you have like orders and you have customers. This table is huge, but it's still like not infinite, right? And uh, in the end of the day, the customer preferences are unlikely to change more than, I don't know, like once a day, right? So that's why we can do that. And in this case, the inference, we, in, uh, we, we build this table once a day, and then the inference is nothing more than just a search in this table, which is faster and more reliable. So we support both architectures. Now we use AWS. So um, uh, in combination with Kubernetes, we used to have SageMaker before, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's already in the past. So now we have our own cluster. Um, Kubernetes is a nice tool which allows for uh, horizontal scalability. So in case if you have like a peak in demand, 
then Kubernetes take care of that. It also takes care of uh, shared resources. So uh, in principle, um, uh, like one machine can support like more than two models. I mean, we don't do it like always, but in theory it's possible, which will allow you to optimize your resources and, and cost of course. So um, we used we used to have like Jenkins pipelines for orchestration. As you can imagine, if you train a model, you need to go through like multiple steps, right? You need to query the data, you need to uh, clean this data, you need to make sure that this data uh, um, is like valid, that it makes sense. Then afterwards, you need to train the model. You need to validate the model. You need to make sure that the model gives you reasonable results, and afterwards put in production. So you can imagine it requires a lot of orchestration, right? So, and the tool that we use for that is what Jenkins, as I said. And now we are moving to more, let's say, uh, modern and machine learning tools uh, related to the Argo family. So, on the monitoring side, we uh, have uh, two bits. So one is uh, uh, basically uh, technical monitoring. So latencies, timeouts, availability errors. And for that, we use like a standard tool from engineering, which is called Datadog. For data quality and the monitoring of uh, our models, we use a different set of tools. So great expectations and the commercial tool, which is called Mona. And so here, what's important is that uh, when you get the data, the input of your model, that it belongs to the same distribution, or it's not too different from the data that you use to train the model, because otherwise you might have a problem, right? So um, that's uh, something which is called like data shifts. And uh, even if we retrain our models relatively often, in some cases, it would be good to know that uh, actually, uh, yeah, the data that you ask your model to uh, process uh, is not really related or doesn't seem, is not similar to what you used to train the model, right? So, and then you can do something about it. Like I don't know, emergence uh, um, in kind of emergency, you can retrain your model like off cycle. Um, you can even like remove the feature, like one of the data points which causes uh, the problem, and uh, the different strategies to deal with these sort of problems. Good. So um, now let's get deeper into the dispatching use case. So uh, any data scientist, or in principle, even 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 any engineer who is on board at, at Globo. One of the first thing uh, he or she uh, hears is Jarvis. So Jarvis is uh, is an optimization algorithm, which uh, finds uh, the best combination of the order and the query. Right. So uh, it's a pretty complex one. So and it has to take a lot of decisions like uh, very quickly. Right. So since we are talking about a like, pretty huge scale, so we're we're talking about hundreds, if not thousands, of decisions like every second. Right? And of course, I mean, it requires to be automated. And the quality of decision should be high because um, it has like a direct impact on the business metrics, right? So if you don't pick like the best courier, right? So it will uh, impact the delivery time and cost per order in the end of the day. Uh, you need to be very careful about choosing the partner as well, right? So because uh, let's say, if we're talking about chains, right? So McDonald's or KFC or whatever. So there's more than one available usually in a, uh, in a city, right? And you need to pick like the right, uh, the right uh, uh, branch to make sure that you take like the best possible decision because the consequences can be also like high delivery time and stuff like that. So, um, and the interesting bit is that uh, I will, will talk about it a little bit later in more detail, how you connect uh the two events in time one is the courier stepping in at the restaurant and another is a food coming out of the kitchen in the ideal world you want these two events to coincide right to uh be completely in sync uh because the consequences is actually if your courier arrives earlier then he or she will have to wait and uh, we generate waste by that and on the other hand if he or she arrives late when the food is ready, the food will get cold, right? So, um, yeah, and um, in principle, it's uh, that's what I said. So initially, we have the uh, pools of orders and couriers, and we have machine learning models, which give input to Jarvis, to the matching algorithm, optimization mechanism. And in the end, um, you can disp dispatch order and courier. So which machine learning models we used for that? So um, before we get to that, so this is a kind of a general overview of the process. As you can see, there are different steps 
for couriers and different steps for um, uh, for their partner, right? And in the end of the day, we want them to merge at a certain stage when the courier arrives to the restaurant. And as you can imagine, like many of the points in this journey for both parties uh, can be optimized and can be um, can be optimized with machine learning. Right? So that's why we invest so much and believe that machine learning is the right tool to solve many of the problems that Lower has. So um, let's take a look at uh, three examples very quickly. So the customer ETA model, ETA is estimated time of arrival. Right? So that's actually what you see when you open the app and you uh, want to order a hamburger, for example. Right? So it shows you this like 20, 30 minutes. So it will be at your place in 20 or 30 minutes. So how do we do that, right? So it's a pretty difficult problem because first of all, we don't know what you're gonna order. There is a difference, right? And if you order like, I don't know, uh, like a snack or if you order five hamburgers, right? So because it will take a different amount of time for the partner to, to, to prepare this. So we don't know, we don't have this information. We can predict that based, <clears throat> based on your habits and based on the time of the day, for example, and day of the week. Uh, uh, but it's, uh, it's already like a machine learning problem. So on the other hand, even if we knew that, uh, we would uh, need to predict uh, based on the day of the week, based on the type of the restaurant, based on the traffic, based on many different factors, how long will it take for you to get your uh, food delivered, right? So um, that, that's actually why this problem is, I would say, it's uh, beautiful in its complexity, right? So it's uh, not like a super difficult model to think about, but in terms of features and factors influences the decision and how we can optimize accuracy, it's a pretty interesting one. So, um, and uh, we also like uh, build a bridge between machine learning and uh, business insights, right? So usually what we do, we have a mechanism which allow us to uh, build some kind of uh, boundaries around our prediction. So let's say if a model gives you a prediction of 22 minutes, for example, you can put like your wood will be delivered between 20 and 30 minutes. It will give us some safety. We can play with uh, those boundaries uh, depending on the needs. Uh, so it's a kind of a strategy that we are following right now. Another one, estimated food of uh, estimated time of food preparation. So ETP model, right? So that's, uh, I think I described it already. So there are two models which we are trying to synchronize. So time of food preparation and time of the courier arrival. So, and the, both of them have challenges. So estimated time of arrival to, to, to the pickup location. Uh, of course, it has like a very traditional challenges. So complexity of features, their robustness and stuff. But the most interesting one is estimated time to prepare. So the problem is that we don't have um, a ground choice here. So why is that? Because when the courier arrives to the restaurant and they sees that uh, the food is ready, we never know whether when it was ready like five seconds ago or maybe five minutes ago, right? So we don't have like a very clear ground truth. So, and in principle, what happens is that uh, speaking abstract terms uh, in mathematics, for example, you know uh, the input, you know the function and you need to find the output, right? In classical machine learning, you have the input, you have the output, you need to approximate or find the function. So in this case, in, in case of estimated time of food preparation, you have the input and then you don't know the function, you don't know the output. So what do we do then? So our solution is, uh, we try different, uh, different uh, ways to solve this problem. We try to classify the partners, we try to apply different strategies uh, to build the model, right? So, but finally, uh, we came to conclusion that uh, uh, what works is reinforcement learning. So for those of you who don't know what that, so apparently when the model gives you a prediction, we try to estimate, uh, try to basically, uh, add, let's say add 30 seconds or subtract 30 seconds from its estimation, right? And see what will, ho what will happen with the overall delivery time and metrics that we really care about. Right, so and we have like a back uh, uh, back feeling uh, mechanism which allows us to uh, to play with these numbers, right, and allows the machine to learn on the way which which strategy is best in this particular moment of time. Right, so and apparently that's something that we found pretty useful, and uh, um, that's what we have in production right now. So it's based on the technology which is called multi-armed bandits. So analogous to the 
uh, yeah, Las Vegas and other like casino, uh, casino mechanisms. But apparently that's it. So we're trying to estimate in production and learn dynamically uh, what is the best uh, post-processing strategy for our models. So um, another one, uh, basically courier, courier mo models, right? So uh, models which describe and try to model different parts of the courier journey. So uh, how long will it take from the start starting point of the courier to the pickup time uh, to the pickup location, right? How long he or she will have to wait at the restaurant or at the uh, any uh, partner location? Um, so uh, etc. So because there are a lot of um, elements of the courier journey which you can model independently or as a whole. So, and uh, um, apparently these models are pretty impactful because first of all, for the partners, right? They, they always like uh, know when the courier will arrive and uh, they can also try to sync synchronize uh, the kitchen with, uh, with that moment in time. And also it's uh, super important for the customers, of course, because based on our um, previous experience, uh, we know that it's super important for the customer to know where the, where the courier is at the, each moment of time. Uh, cool. So, and here actually the complexity comes from the different variety or diversity of features, right? So we're talking about the different geographical model, the geographical features that we're using, right? So different sorts of uh, distances uh, bearing like flight distance between A and B, etc. So we are using um, the time features, of course, right? So, and also like a lot of features related to the orders, which are a little bit less, let's say, obvious, right? So uh, um, what is the difference, for example, between the uh, moment of acceptance and the start or end of the shift, right? So how, uh, how tired the courier is, for example, right? So how many couriers he or she has delivered uh, historically over a certain period of time, right? So, and uh, things like that. So uh, we, we take all these things into account when we um, do the, when we build our courier models. So uh, last point, and then we'll have some time for questions, I believe. So with the machine learning metrics. Um, for those of you who have, uh, let's say data science, classic data science background, right? From universities, for instance, um, it's not very obvious, I guess, because they don't teach people at the universities uh, on how to measure the how measure the performance of your machine learning models in production. Right, so um, there are obvious things coming from engineering, which not many data scientists know. For example, latency, availability, timeouts. Right, so you need to treat your machine learning model um, in the same fashion as you would treat like any let's say microservice or any uh, um, any backend service in your application or any service right that you that you maintain so you need to know like how many requests uh, it can process per minute or per second right you need to understand what is the latency because imagine that if your latency is super high right you open it up and then you see uh, a circle with for like 20 30 40 seconds right so which is trying to estimate the predicted time of your um, of your uh, order arrival, you probably it wouldn't be like a good uh, experience, right? I mean, this is said something that you need to think about like, from the beginning. And if your model is too heavy, or it would take too much time to infer, it would might have like a critical uh, impact on your on the models. Uh, another one is the performance of your models, right? So, and we're not just talking about like performance of the model right now. We're talking about what how will your model react if something unexpected happens. Right. In our case, it's already like a pretty much modeled and expected to end. But imagine if uh, it starts raining. Of course, it will change everything. Right. It will change the amount of um, orders we get because people don't want to leave their houses or offices. It will also impact the um, uh, arrival time of the couriers, of course. Right. So the traffic will become different, and etc. There are other sorts of events which uh, uh, what we call them external events. Uh, which we try to model, but not in terms of uh, machine learning prediction, but in terms of external knowledge acquisition. For example, football games. Right? So for us, I mean, uh, our business is less and less uh, dependent on, uh, on Spain because we grow and expand internationally. But uh, traditionally, like when Barcelona plays, for example, football, football club Barcelona plays, 
uh, we have like a big peak in uh, pizzas and beer and all this stuff, right? So, and of course, like this is something we cannot predict. We have to know that somehow. So, um, and uh, another one is data shift. I think I uh, touched base on that a little bit, but uh, once again, so uh, when the uh, statistics, let's say, when the um, nature of the data that you get at the input of your model is becoming too different from the data that your model was trained on, right? So basically it's a very new data that it has never seen before. Then you start having a problem. You have you start having a problem related primarily to the performance of the model, right? So, and uh, unless you have a mechanism for that, you will never know like what exactly has happened, right? So you need to look at the, each of the features uh, which you use as the input of the model and you need to see what happens with them, right? And if one of them you see is fluctu fluctuates like crazy, so usually, for example, it goes between 20 and 40 in, uh, let's say, 95% of cases, but now you see that it goes from zero to 1,000, right? Then probably this is this is a troublemaker and you can do something about it. Um, yeah, and uh, least but not, uh, last but not least is a controlled online experimentation. So, of course, like what happens is that uh, if you check the quality of the model, um, just on the kind of an isolated and static data set, it won't tell you much. I mean, it will tell you like something probably about how the model would perform uh, today, right? At this given moment in, uh, in time, but you will never know like what will happen when you put it in production and start using it, right? As a part of your business process. So that's why people use like A-B tests, for example, old version of the model versus new version of the model, or let's say business rules versus machine learning. And uh, then you need to accumulate statistics for two weeks, for instance, maybe two months, it depends on how much traffic you get. And in the end, you will see what difference it makes, right? So in some situations, it's impossible. Uh, I don't I don't think we have time to go into detail. For example, um, uh, let's say when every change uh, that uh, your machine learning model suggests change the environment itself, right? So every time, for example, when we assign a courier to an order, this courier becomes unavailable which means that actually the world has changed as well. And we cannot really run an A-B test because it won't be the same environment in, uh, in control and variant, right? So there are other ways to do A-B tests, like let's say multi-arm bandits. Um, uh, it's an reinforcement learning similar to what I showed to you in the application to estimated time of food preparation. Um, and apparently uh, what happens is that uh, multi-arm bandits is kind of, for me at least, it's a faster way to run A-B tests because the um, modern bandits, they try to uh, split your traffic in a, let's say, wise way, in a smart way, and they try to balance exploration and exploitation, right? So apparently it's more difficult to run, it's more difficult to set up, but in my eyes, it's, um, that's a future. That's where A-B testing is going in general. So yeah, um, that's it on my end. I just wanted to mention that uh, we are growing, we are hiring. So whatever you are, a data scientist, uh, uh, product manager, uh, business person, take a look at our career website. It's very easy to find. Ping me as well on LinkedIn. Uh, if you'd like, I'll try to answer all your questions. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So I think we have five minutes. So let's take a look at the questions which uh, you might get. Let me refresh it. Um, yeah, it seems that there are no questions, at least not for now um yeah then i think we're good to go once again if you want to talk if you want to discuss um the machine learning the way how we use machine learning or um if you're interested in uh, positions at global please uh, let me know um yeah i'm always trying to be responsive on linkedin and i think that's it right thank you very much have a good day everyone and have the rest of the event have a great rest of the event.